is because we lack wisdom and compassion. So a bodhisattva then, as I said, has perfect compassion and perfect wisdom. So where do we begin then? Where do we begin to develop this uh, wisdom and compassion? Well, according to the Buddha, we start with refuge. We normally think of them as separate things. There's going for refuge, and then there's wisdom and compassion. But if we're going to take the Buddhist path, the bodhisattva path, if we're going to become bodhisattvas, well, first we have to commit ourselves to that path, right? So uh, my favorite example is if you want to go on vacation, let's say you want to go to Hawaii on vacation, uh, you can buy guidebooks, you can get a new bathing suit for the beach, you can buy maps, you can tell your friends about your plans, you can look up information about Hawaii on the internet, but you will never, ever arrive in Hawaii unless you get on the plane first. The same thing with going for refuge. We will never achieve the goal of enlightenment unless we set foot on the path. This is what refuge is. Refuge is like getting on the plane to go to Hawaii. It's the first step. Without refuge, we will never achieve perfect wisdom and compassion. Now, of course, there have been many non-Buddhist religious teachers who have had compassion and wisdom, great compassion and wisdom even, but in order to achieve the Buddhist goal of enlightenment as laid out by the Buddha, first we have to commit ourselves to following the Buddha's teachings. Now there are uh, different elements to understanding uh, refuge. And so as I just described, first, refuge is the doorway to the Dharma. Uh, the Dharma, of course, being the Buddhist teachings. Uh, it's the, it's, when we go for refuge, we have then opened the door uh, to our understanding and practice of the Buddhist teachings. Now, we often talk about people who have gone for refuge as being in the Buddha's family. I think it's really more like um, we become the Buddha's nieces and nephews. It's when we take the bodhisattva vow, which I'll talk about more in a moment, when we take the bodhisattva vow, that's when we really become the Buddha's children. That's when we're really completely uh, on the path to becoming enlightened. Refuge is the first step. So it's like we enter the Buddha's home as his nieces and nephews. And then second, refuge is the basis for all the other precepts and vows. Uh, you cannot take the bodhisattva vows unless you have first gone for refuge. Also, monks and nuns cannot become monks and nuns unless they have first gone for refuge. I can't go to Canada and get an apartment and then say, okay, I'm a Canadian citizen, and then expect the Canadian government to give me a passport. If only it was that simple. You just show up in the country where you want to live and snap your fingers and you're a citizen. No, you have to go through the process. Well, refuge is the first part of that process. It's also the source of all virtuous qualities. It's the source, refuge is the source of all the good qualities. Because the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have all these good qualities. And they began with refuge. So by going for refuge, we're opening that door to cultivating and, and not really acquiring but uh, cultivating or revealing those qualities within ourselves. Now the cause for going for refuge is what we call confident faith. There are different kinds of faith. Uh, it's confident faith. But the first kind of faith we call vivid faith or admiring faith. A better definition would be, or a better description would be admiring faith. So admiring faith is when we look at something in the, from afar and we say, oh, that's really nice, I like that. But then we don't do anything about it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people in the United States who are not Buddhists, but they have a really good impression of the Buddha and Buddhists. Uh, they think the Dalai Lama is really great, but then they don't really know anything about the Buddhist teaching. Maybe they have a Buddha statue in their home, they like the way it looks, but they don't know anything about the Buddhist teaching. This is a kind of admiring thing. 
even if you even if you go for refuge initially, if you if you do that ceremony, but you don't follow up, you don't learn anything more about the Buddha. You don't learn anything more about the Buddha's teaching. We could say that you have admiring faith, and that's fine. That's fine. But then the next kind of faith is called longing faith or yearning faith. So this is defined as the wish that if we practice the Dharma, then in the future. Uh, we will achieve great wisdom and be like the bodhisattvas whose stories we hear. So we might hear of the wonderful qualities of uh, Amitabha Buddha's pure land, and we might wish to be reborn there uh, in kind of a casual way. So this is kind of a yearning faith or longing faith. But then there's confident faith. This is also called trusting faith. This is when we know something of the Dharma, and we are convinced that it is true. That's why it's confident faith. It isn't blind faith. There's no room in the Buddhist teaching, ultimately, for blind faith. Blind faith is believing without knowledge. We need to have this confident faith. So when we've studied something of the Dharma, and we're convinced that it's true, and then we're motivated to really pursue the Dharma, then we have this confident faith. So this might seem a little contradictory. I just said that confident faith is the cause of going for refuge. But it's also, it also comes later, when we know something of the Dharma. That's because we can think of going for refuge in two ways. There's going through the ritual of refuge and officially becoming Buddhist. But then there's the real refuge, which again comes later, when we have learned the Dharma and we're really convinced that we made the right decision. That's the real refuge. When we see that our negative habits of getting angry and feeling jealous and greedy and resentful when we see that this is suffering and we don't want it. When we understand that we also cause suffering for others and we don't want to do that anymore. When we see that chasing after happiness in money and power and defeating our enemies, when we see that that's really kind of useless and we don't want to be like that anymore, that's when we have real remedy. So this, this is uh, how we approach refuge. Now there's also, there's another way of looking at refuge. There's two kinds of refuge. There's one that we call temporary causal refuge. The temporary cause of refuge. This is when we see ourselves as separate from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. When we see ourselves as separate from them. And we pray to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas for help, perhaps, when we think, well, maybe someday I'll be like them. So it's temporary, because as we learn more of the Dharma, that view changes. And then we start to develop the, uh, the ultimate resultant refuge. And it's also causal. We say that it's a cause of this second kind of refuge. That's what we call it, temporary causal refuge. So then we have the ultimate resultant refuge. And that's when we go for refuge in the Three Jewels as representatives of our future selves. When we understand that we all have the Buddha nature, when we really understand that our true nature is not bad, our true nature is in fact no different from that of a perfectly enlightened being. And, so, and that when we are bowing in the temple, we understand that we're not only bowing to Shakyamuni Buddha and Amitabha Buddha as beings that are separate from ourselves, but we're also bowing to our own Buddha nature within and the Buddha nature of all sentient beings. When we really understand that, then we have this ultimate resultant refuge. But the first one leads to the second, and so they're both good. So this is, how, this is how we approach refuge. So the bodhisattva path then begins with refuge. At some point, we then take, we then take the bodhisattva vow. Uh, I'd like to read you, actually, this is one of my favorite books. Uh, before I came back to uh, California, I was overseas for two years. I'll explain this in a moment. Uh, I, I went to uh, South Korea for a while, and then I spent a little over a year in um, Nepal. And in Nepal, I studied at a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. I lived with the Tibetan family, but I was studying at an institute there. And this was the text that we studied. It's the first text 
that Tibetan monks study in a monastic college. In English, it's called the Way of the Bodhisattva, or sometimes it's called a guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. The Tibetan translation of this title is um, entering, entering the Conduct of Bodhisattvas. This is incredibly famous. It was written by Shantideva, who was a 9th century Indian Buddhist master. Uh, and so I would like to read uh, his description, his, his explanation, or his uh, poetry, really, uh, describing the Bodhisattva vow. So this is his wish. May I be a guard for those who are protectorless, a guide for those who journey on the road. For those who wish to cross the water, may I be a boat, a raft, a bridge. May I be an isle for those who yearn for land, a lamp for those who long for light, for all who need a resting place, a bed. For those who need a servant, may I be their slave. May I be the wishing jewel, the vase of wealth, a word of power and the supreme healing May I be the tree of miracles, for every being the abundant cow. Just like the earth and space itself, and all the other mighty elements, for boundless multitudes of beings,